I can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. Every day is a trial we're talking about truth or consequences. Certainly what I'm going to be talking about is consequences of certain ideas, because ideas do have huge impacts. And certainly if we think about 20th century history, which I teach, I teach a course in 20th century Europe I'm teaching right now, uh, we can see the consequences of ideas that have gone uh, astray. We see the consequences of uh, Nazism, for example, and the Holocaust, some of the issues that I deal with in my research. But we also see uh, Stalinism, Marxism, the impact of that, that that's had on the world. So I think it's worth thinking about some of these issues and to realize that these really are serious matters that affect people's lives and affect people's deaths. I have uh, entitled my talk, From Darwin to Hitler, which is the title of my book, but I've also given it uh, an alternate title, which is Does Darwinism Devalue Human Life? And this is going to be one of the key issues I'm going to uh, talk about. And I admit that the title of my presentation, which is also the title of my book, uh, is controversial. And I hope it will stir up some healthy controversy. However, I also need to clear up uh, some possible misunderstandings from the very start. First, nowhere do I argue that Darwinism leads inevitably to Hitler, that there's a logical necessity there, or to the Holocaust. To state the obvious, uh, neither Darwin nor most Darwinists are Nazis. Okay, so we need to clear that away from the very start. In fact, in my book, I don't even really discuss, uh, I don't even really make a philosophical argument. I make a historical argument about looking at how Darwinists themselves applied the ideas of Darwinism. So this isn't my philosophical spin on what Darwinism should imply or might imply or even must imply. Rather, I'm saying this is how Darwinists looked at uh, Darwinism and its implications for human life and human death. Uh, I actually state in the very introduction that the readers themselves need to uh, try to think about what the logic is of these Darwinian thinkers. Now I happen to think there is a certain kind of logic to it, uh, but uh, whether one agrees or disagrees with that viewpoint uh, and whether one agrees or disagrees with these Darwinists who I'm going to talk about who did devalue human life, uh, the historical impact of their ideas on Western culture has been immense. And that's what I want to uh, focus on today. I, actually, though, I'm also in this presentation going to go a little bit beyond the material in my book uh, by going on and talking about uh, some of the contemporary Darwinist thinkers who are likewise uh, making some of the same kinds of moves uh, that the people I investigated did. Most of my work was in the late 19th, early 20th century Germany. <clears throat> Uh, and so, but there are also contemporary uh, American and British and uh, German thinkers today that are saying similar kinds of things. Uh, and so I'm going to try to make explicit how these things do relate to contemporary debates on bioethics. A second point that I want to make before I get going is that I, when I began my research, I didn't begin trying to link Darwin with Hitler. I did my dissertation on the uh, impact of so Darwinism on German socialists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And as I was doing that, I began, became interested in evolutionary ethics because I noticed that a lot of these German thinkers were writing about ethics and trying to set up and trying to promote some kind of evolutionary ethic. Uh, when I first started this research, I wasn't even thinking about Hitler. In fact, and I was a little wary of that because there's a book by a, a scholar named Daniel Gassman who's not taken very seriously by most uh, historians, who does try to draw a very direct line from Ernst Haeckel, who was the leading German Darwinist, to Hitler. Uh, and he does it in ways that don't really make a lot of sense. And I agree with a lot of the criticisms that have been leveled at him. So I was a little wary of making that kind of connection. Nonetheless, I obviously did make the connection, uh, ultimately. Uh, and I believe it was a case of being driven there by the uh, empirical data that turned up uh, time and again and brought me 
uh, to the point where I uh, made the connections, but I think in a much more subtle and uh, more uh, truthful way, perhaps, than Daniel Gassman uh, had. There were two reasons that I made this sort of unexpected turn in my research. First of all, as I began studying evolutionary ethics in late 19th century Germany, I started finding out that German eugenicists were in the forefront of talking about evolutionary ethics. Uh, and I hadn't realized that uh, until getting underway with my research somewhat. And so I better say just a little bit about eugenics because that's one of the themes in my book. Uh, and uh, it has a big bearing then on uh, what I'm going to have to say here. Francis Galton, here's a biography uh, of him, is considered the founding father of eugenics. Eugenics was a movement that was very prominent in the late 19th and early 20th centuries to try to improve human heredity. Uh, Galton got that idea, by the way, in part from reading Darwin's Origin of Species by his own admission. Darwin was his cousin, uh, and he imbibed Darwinian ideas. And in fact, all of the German eugenicists likewise argued very strongly that their uh, ideology was based upon Darwinism. In fact, there was a fear among many of these eugenicists in the late 19th and early 20th centuries that because modern culture, especially modern medicine, was uh, undermining natural selection by allowing the, quote, unfit to survive and reproduce, that this was producing something of a problem. And so the way to get around the problem of the deterioration or degeneration, as the term was used quite often in the late 19th, early 20th century, the way to get around that problem of degeneration was to use artificial selection. And so this is then what eugenics was all about, trying to use some way of artificially selecting uh, humans uh, to produce, to get away from degeneration, and hopefully also to then uh, improve the human species and to direct human evolution. So this is one reason then, the issue of eugenics that began driving me in the direction of my research. The second issue was in 1995, I offered a seminar called Darwinism, Religion, and Society. And in that seminar, we discussed a book by James Rachels. And that book was called Created from Animals, The Moral Implications of Evolution. As we began discussing this book in the seminar, two very bright students in that seminar uh, said that they believe that Darwinism proved moral relativism. Well, that caught my attention, and so I decided to give them a sort of concrete example to see how far they were willing to drive that, and I said, so, okay, what about Hitler? Was, what about Hitler? Was he evil? Was he, uh, you know, what, what would you say about him? And without batting an eye, they said, correct, he was neither good nor evil. You know, they wanted to drive the moral relativism as far as it would go. Uh, I was rather horrified by that, of course. Uh, so that got me thinking in certain ways about Darwinism and moral relativism. Then the second thing uh, about Rachel's book is that Rachel's whole argument is that Darwinism undermines the Judeo-Christian concept of the sanctity of human life. And so that got me thinking about some of these uh, German Darwinists that I'd read about uh, who had, some of them had, had similar kinds of ideas. And, for example, one of them that I already knew about at this point was Ernst Haeckel, who was the leading Darwinist in Germany in the late 19th century and on into the early 20th century. Uh, and Haeckel had, in, already in 1870, proposed infanticide for those with congenital illnesses, especially mental illnesses. So I moved back into my research with this question then, does Darwinism devalue human life, or at least do Darwinists think that Darwinism devalues human life. And I started investigating then these uh, Darwinist thinkers using that question. And that question is very controversial. Does Darwinism uh, devalue human life? There are many Darwinists who will say that Darwinism doesn't have anything to do with ethics or morality. They'll invoke what's called the naturalistic fallacy, which states that you can't get from is to ought. <clears throat> And they will call uh, Hitler's invocation of Darwinism, they'll sometimes call it vulgar Darwinism or distorted Darwinism. I've heard those uh, various terms. However, whatever the philosophical argument one wants to make about that, the plain fact of the matter is historically that many leading Darwinists did and still do today 
uh, believe that Darwinism does have strong ethical implications. Darwin himself did, by the way. Uh, and there were actually many of them who expressed positions very close to Rachel's own position. And so my research then sort of underlines this train of thought and the implications, or rather the uh, consequences that it had. Now, I want to talk then about what some of these implications are. And when I say this, the implications of Darwinism for devaluing human life, this is not just my own philosophical spin. I'm giving you what Darwinists themselves are saying about Darwinism. Now, again, not all Darwinists are going to agree with this. I acknowledge that. But nonetheless, there are many Darwinists uh, who do uh, buy into these particular ideas that I'm going to uh, put forward to you uh, tonight. First of all, human inequality. Evolution requires variation. There has to be biological variation for evolution to occur. And many <clears throat> scientists argued, especially in the late 19th century, that that meant that humans are unequal biologically. And they very often <clears throat> uh, spelled that out into uh, all sorts of anti-egalitarian kind of thinking. Uh, Ernst Haeckel, for example, uh, wrote several essays that were strongly anti-socialist, claiming that the socialists were unscientific because they believed in equality of humanity. And he said, no, science proves the inequality of humanity. And he wasn't the only one. There were a number of uh, Darwinists who wrote very strongly against the socialist movement because of this issue of uh, human equality. If you look at the eugenics literature, the eugenics lit literature is replete with examples of people talking about human inequality. Uh, the word inferiority uh, occurs again and again and again and again in eugenics literature. They're, they're concerned about the inferior, and you'll see this in some of the slides I'm going to show you in a little bit uh, here too. Just to give you one uh, concrete example, Hugo Ribert, who was a uh, medical professor, I believe he was at the University of Bonn, wrote in one of his books about, on eugenics, quote, and this is, again, a fairly similar statement to many other eugenicists, too. This is not just sort of off-the-wall fringe stuff. This is mainstream uh, medical professor eugenics ideology. He said, the care for individuals who from birth onwards are useless alike mentally and physically, who for themselves and their fellow creatures are a burden merely, persons of negative value, is a function altogether useless to humanity and indeed positively injurious. I mean, he used some pretty strong language there to make clear. Uh, I mean, words, uh, they're a burden, they're negative value, uh, useless to humanity, and injurious. Those were common ideas uh, at the time about those who had hereditary illnesses, especially mental illnesses. Now, there were two ways that this inequality could work, and it did work this way, in fact, in the Darwinian scene in the 19th and early 20th centuries. First of all, within society. Okay, here I have a, a picture that comes from a, a book by a prominent psychiatrist in Germany in his 1903 book about criminal anthropology, where he shows the allegedly ape-like features of an Italian criminal. This is based on Cesar Lombroso's uh, ideas. Lombroso was an Italian psychiatrist who founded uh, what's called criminal anthropology, and he believed that criminals were a throwback, an evolutionary throwback, uh, and thus they, he thought they would have physical features that were more like apes. And so the sloping forehead, the nose, you know, that was considered ape-like characteristics that these criminals allegedly had. And there were also other Darwinists talking the same thing about mental illnesses, talking about how people who had mental illnesses were evolutionary throwbacks to uh, ape ancestors and simply didn't have the, uh, some of these human capacities uh, because they were uh, re-emerging their ape uh, things. So here we see then within society there's this inequality, and especially it had to do with the mentally ill and criminals. And by the way, psychiatrists were on the forefront of the eugenics movement. They were really one of the driving forces in the eugenics movement. But not only would it apply within society, it also applied across societies, especially dealing with race. Uh, we were just discussing over dinner uh, here about uh, Darwin's own ideas, and Darwin did uh, himself uh, believe in the inequality of races. Uh, 
However, Ernst Haeckel, the le leading Darwinist in Germany, was even more radically inegalitarian in his racial scheme. Here is a frontispiece to his uh, very popular book, uh, Natürliche Schöpfungsgeschichte, which means Natural History of Creation. Uh, and in that, he has 12 pictures here. And 